Hello. Today we will talk about cyber digital twins and how implementing it within the automotive industry may add a new level of transparency to our supply chain. This session is brought to you by the CEO of Cybellum, Slava Bonfman. Enjoy the presentation. Slava, stage is yours. Hey everyone, I'm Slava Bronfman and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Cybell and also the co-leader of uh, the use case task force at the ISO 21434 committee. And today in the 20 minutes or so that we have together, I would like to present to you a kind of, um, call it a technologically enabled uh, vision to a full transparency throughout uh, the entire automotive supply chain. Uh, the vision is actually based on a concept that I'll present today, it's called Cyber Digital Twins. Uh, okay, so, um, but before that, I'd like actually to start with, uh, with a very short story uh, that we have witnessed uh, firsthand not too long ago, actually, uh, just around the end of, uh, of June this year. So, um, and it happened at one of our, uh, of our main par partners that we are working actually very, very close together. Uh, the partner is a large OEM uh, from Asia and um, a security analyst that was uh, responsible working at that OEM and responsible for vulnerability analysis um, read it in news about a newly discovered vulnerability uh, which is named uh, Ripple 20. So uh, I'm sure that you probably heard about this vulnerability as uh, it affects uh, you know, the TCP IP stack of uh, it affects the TCP IP stack and was relevant to millions of embedded devices uh, worldwide, uh, including many, many ECUs uh, in the automotive space. Uh, but actually what, uh, what I found interesting in that specific case wasn't the, the vulnerability itself uh, or even not the, you know, the mitigation plans that followed, uh, but, uh, but actually the chain of events, like really what happened. Uh, we, can, we can see it actually like uh, the ripple effect that happened there and it was a really ripple effect. Um, so, um, how it affected like the, the supply chain of that specific OEM, uh, and I'm sure it's not unique to, to, to that OEM, it's probably you know, common to many others as well. So, uh, and the story went uh, something like this. So first, uh, the, security, uh, the security researcher performed an, uh, an internal analysis, right, to understand like the potential, even the potential risk, you know, just by reading uh, news from the media, uh, like the one, you know, the, the article showed from ZDNet and trying to, you know, theoretically map a component that might have, uh, that might be at risk. So um, then what happened is that he sent manual emails uh, to the specific points of contact uh, within any relevant supplier that they have uh, and asking, you know, kind of verification on how Ripple 20 was affecting, you know, the components uh, that they supplied to them and how severe also the, the effect was. So um, what was even, uh, to me at least, uh, even more interesting to see is that, uh, funny enough, the email chain was received by, uh, by another customer of, of ours, uh, which is a large European uh, tier one supplier. So uh, the email that, uh, that the supplier received looked uh, more, I would call it like, uh, like an SLA requirement document, right? So it was reading something like, uh, you know, sorry, uh, like, like, uh, like the following, like, please provide a list of components that are vulnerable to Ripple 20 vulnerability, and please do it within the next uh, 48 hours. And uh, uh, for the ones that are vulnerable, if you find it vulnerable, please issue a patch or a fix or a workaround in the next 96 hours. Uh, from the tier one direction, actually, it was interesting to see how much an inquiry that should, you know, uh, be, have been answered relatively quickly and easily, uh, but actually generated a, a real problem there, a real effect. So, um, um, and why? Basically because the main reason that the development team that were responsible potentially uh, for this, you know, for this relevant PCUs have been dissolved already, you know, moving to, to developing new programs is usually the case with, uh, you know, programs that reach production or, you know, approach their end of lifetime. Um, so who was responsible actually was the product security team of this uh, you know, tier one supplier who had launched um, a full in-house investigation trying to understand you know, through various analyses and methods and assessments uh, what are the, comp the components um, that are really you know, relevant and affected and, um, uh, to this vulnerability. So to make a long story short, 
the answer then delivered to the OEM was like, you know, many things in life, uh, it depends. So uh, it depends, uh, and it depends on the configuration of the specific ECU, which flags are on and which flags are off, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. So um, fast forward almost uh, two weeks, armed kind of with this vague answer, the OEM launched its own internal assessment as well, uh, and actually trying you know, to put together a list of components that were affected, um, and then only uh, a list of vehicles that had these specific components. You know, this is also not something that they have uh, or they had just you know, out of the box, and trying to understand for each vehicle what is the configuration that is there, to really understand, you know, the actual effect of this specific Ripple 20 vulnerability and also what is the mitigation that might be possible for that. Uh, all in all, this process, you know, from start to end, uh, from the first piece of news like I showed, you know, from ZDNet to the conclusion took uh, over three weeks. And, you know, we are talking here about, you know, famous vulnerability, but it's, uh, but it's a single vulnerability, right? So. Uh, yeah, now I'm sure that you know this story must sound uh, familiar, and many of you can relate to that. Uh, and you know, this is just how uh, things are done in our industry. And I choose uh, you know this case to emphasize kind of uh, the status quo uh, that we have today, and maybe you know the time we have today to, to question it and see if that can be changed. So um, I would like to take you know the next 15 minutes or so to share with you a new approach. One that might allow, uh, you know, a true transparency within our supply chain uh, and a higher level of security and, uh, you know, so uh, to, to deliver kind of, of that. So, uh, let me jump further. So, let's just maybe jump back for a second and look where we are uh, right now. And uh, so, theoretically, just, you know, just a few years ago, uh, these issues of cybersecurity, vulnerabilities, and ECUs at risk were, um, were practically non-issues. Uh, both because of, you know, the number of advanced ECUs and their connectivity, uh, and of course the exposure to risk, and, um, you know, if there is no connectivity, no advanced ECUs, there is practically no cybersecurity risk. But maybe even more interesting is to understand, you know, the consequences of that. And what we have today, um, and what was true for you know yesterday's world. So obviously we have some uh, regulations and standards, but they were more around you know functional safety, or like the ISO 26262, um, and um, you know all the we were mainly doing in, in terms of cybersecurity manual stuff, like penetration testing. You know one of projects of penetration testing or something like that, and uh, it was pretty much uh, enough. Uh, but obviously today with the new UNEC uh, WP29 regulation, which is just around the corner, and the ISO 21434 standard that, um, you know, although it's in the, uh, in the draft phase already, we see that it's being adopted by, by many, you know, players around the globe. Um, and what we like to call here at Sabellum is the industry will need to, you know, to shift gears and start working at the speed of software, right? We are. Um, you know, all the well-known ter terms of, uh, you know, uh, agile developing and so on, we'll see more and more of them uh, just because this is the real need today uh, in the automotive world. And of course, uh, we'll see that things, uh, you know, all the assessments and monitoring are not stopping kind of the, uh, in the production phase, uh, but you constantly need to evolve and to do that. Um, and so, you know, going back to the story of the Ripple 20 and how it affected uh, this specific OEM in Tier 1, uh, looking back at that, we are asking ourselves, like, why this is happening, right? And why we don't have a really true transparency for everything to understand exactly, you know, have a vulnerability, what are the affected components of that? Uh, and, uh, you know, without transparency, we have this kind of famous uh, question in the IT world that uh, every, you know, IT CISO usually, this is kind of the number one, one rule in his playbook, is um, I cannot secure what I cannot see, right? The first thing is visibility. The first thing is asset identification. Uh, there is no kind of real situation where you have in your IT network some server somewhere that you don't know exactly what is the software bill of materials of that, you know, what is the configuration, what is the operating system that is installed. 
Uh, however, in the automotive world, it's not the case. You know, for, for many reasons, uh, historical reasons, maybe that the you know that the industry is built on supply chain, all the intellectual property issues. Uh, so practically, you know, we don't have it today, uh, and, it's, and it's a must. So um, yeah, so let me maybe you know propose or present you an approach that might uh, solve this issue. Um, so we call it a uh, cyber digital twin. So digital twins are not a new concept. Uh, we hear about them quite a lot, also in automotive space. Uh, they're used a lot for, uh, of course, for manufacturing, but also for, uh, you know, for simulation for autonomous vehicles and so on. Um, so let's start, what is a uh, cyber digital twin? So by definition, a cyber digital twin or a digital twin in general is an identical replica of, uh, of a real world component. Uh, in terms of cyber digital twin, we mean an identical replica that actually encapsulates inside all the relevant data that is needed for cyber uh, security assessment or for cyber security you know, analysis of the component or the entire system, uh, you know, if it's a full vehicle, so it can be um, a list of digital twins and the interaction between them. Uh, and the point here is that this uh, cyber digital twin, again, encapsulates inside uh, everything that you need to know about the component um, so from you know the software bill of materials of that to the hardening mechanisms like how the secure booting are implemented if there is an over the update about it what are the security requirements about it so it really not only should include uh, or includes the uh, the characteristics themselves of the component but actually the entire history of that so uh, you actually can understand you know if you are in the post-production phase what were the uh, cybersecurity requirements from the TARA. And by that, we need to perform the entire analysis. So again, keep in mind that uh, the point is that it has all the, uh, uh, all the parameters that you need in order to, uh, to investigate any cybersecurity issue that might affect a specific component. So um, in the interest of time, I won't get into the technical details of how to produce that. You can do it in another video. But, um, but another characteristic that is very important is that uh, this entity or this artifact should be transferable, right? You should feel comfortable as a tier one to send it to your OEM um, without any you know, issues or questions about intellectual property or, or something like that, uh, but still give the OEM enough power to do investigations like you know, about vulnerabilities uh, without you know, need to go back to you and try to, to ask you how things are implemented inside and what is the configuration of your, you know, of your web server or, or, or something like that. So, um, and just imagine if we do have this kind of artifact uh, that is developed throughout the entire life cycle, how, uh, how a life cycle of a component or a vehicle can look like, right? So if we take a look at this, um, at this V-shaped graph, which is, you know, in our industry is more like a W-shaped graph, so at very early, at very early on in the process, really in the design concept phase, uh, when the OEM uh, delivers the requirements, today you know they are stored in uh, various systems, uh, um, like the door systems of IBM that stores requirements and many others, and it's very much not structured. And um, the biggest problem of that that uh, as you move along the sort of the process, right, uh, the life cycle, the development life cycle, you usually you usually lose. Uh, this information or rarely go back to that. Uh, so the point if you have an entity or artifact that stores this data, including you know, all the requirements, the TARA even that is made during the design phase, then you deliver this uh, cyber digital twin you know, to the development teams. It can be the tier two, the tier one, and they, then they start to add to that, right? Uh, to store there if there is already a firmware, uh, the encryption keys, you know, all the uh, software bill of materials and the configuration that is inside the entire control flow graph uh, and so on and so forth. So you receive uh, an entity that, uh, you know, really stores all the information that you need. And once you get to the validation phase, so you don't need maybe to start again work with, uh, you know, with a closed, box, um, uh, closed um, uh, component, black box component, and you might not need a full penetration testing because it's more like a gray box. Uh, component. You, you don't have the source code, but you have a digital twin of the component that you can read uh, and work against and simulate. So you can run both static analysis, dynamic analysis, perform a full simulation and simulation of the component. 
uh, and have the power that uh, you know be just before your uh, just before the start of production. Uh, later, moving you know uh, to the to the operational phase once the vehicle is on, uh, already on the road and you have the vehicle uh, already there. So you know uh, you already can add in the map to each component what is the VIN number that it is uh, installed in. Uh, what is the you know the SIM card uh, configuration there, uh, and you really can start to perform. You kind of get a full uh, virtual, uh, let's say, uh, virtual asset management, and really mapping from each component the entire bill of materials of that uh, of that component to the relevant uh, vehicle identifier that is running on the road. Uh, so for you know for the security ana analyst and the team that is performing the security operations. Uh, it can be really easy, or uh, a lot easier, to perform uh, all the analysis that they need. So, given we have something like that, just think about how you know how many things we can achieve. So, uh, first thing, you know, a term that is widely used in our industry for uh, uh, for the last you know, couple of years, I would say, is harmonization. And really, how you can achieve a true harmonization if you don't have you know a standard entity uh, that you really can uh, work on. Right, so imagine this digital twin that has a structured uh, specification that you really can work in, uh, on and really encapsulate all the data inside. Uh, so for the first time, you can actually share it right uh, between the tier two and the tier one, between the tier one and the OEM, uh, and so on and so forth, um, and really receive for the first time a true harmonization between anything, and you can perform, you know, uh, all the traceability because it encapsulates. Uh, all the development history inside the, the digital queen, uh, but also all the other parameters that um, that you need in order to perform this kind of communication. Uh, another, you know, the biggest problem that we see today, and uh, I like to call it VIN to S bomb, really to understand, uh, you know, from a VIN number, uh, what is the entire software bill of materials that is inside, and you know, um, it's really interesting to see that uh, we as an industry are, are still not there. Uh, it's really hard to answer this um, relatively simple question, um, and, and we think that you know technology like a cyber digital twin that is an identical replica of the vehicle that is running on the road, and you constantly also you know maintain that and update that uh, can can give an answer to that um, uh, to that issue and give you kind of uh, a full transparency from a VIN number to the full list of um, you know software bill of materials and the entire. Uh, configuration that is uh, attached to that. The other part that is very also interesting, uh, and we talk about it a lot also in the context of you know cybersecurity standards and regulations, is uh, collaboration. You really need to work you know in a kind of a collaborative uh, manner with your um, with your suppliers. You know if you are an OEM, you need to work in collaborative manner with your auditor. Of course, you know if you have some MSSP that will operate your VSOC. Uh, how you deliver, you know, uh, some kind of an entity that is not just documentation, uh, it's something that is smarter uh, as part of the entire process. So kind of a cyber digital twin can give an answer to this uh, entire collaboration issue. So, uh, so what I basically presented here, again, in a very, very, very high level, is kind of a vision uh, leveraging a cyber digital twin uh, to, again, to uh, receive a full harmonization, traceability, uh, and collaboration in, um, uh, in the automotive ecosystem. Um, but again, the point is, I think here to, to emphasize, is that uh, we need maybe to perform what I call cyber digital transformation uh, to have all the data that we have in the vehicle somehow stored in uh, a digital entity, uh, but not just a general digital entity, because it ha should store uh, the cyber security specific characteristics and uh, the technology of cyber digital twin is mature enough uh, that can be the answer to that um, you know, emerging problem. So uh, yeah, so that's about it. Let me also maybe very, very quickly uh, tell you uh, about Cybellum and what Cybellum is all about. So Cybellum's mission is to enable OEMs and their suppliers uh, to develop and maintain secure products, secure automotive products. Uh, and we are doing that, you know, we have uh, products for the security assessment and for security operations, but uh, it's all powered by a cyber digital twin platform. So we um, kind of uh, made an implementation of this cyber digital concept, and uh, on top of that, you know, uh, leveraging this platform, we can deliver three main pillars to the, 
uh, to, to our customers, which is uh, one a full vulnerability uh, management system throughout the entire product lifecycle. And by vulnerability management, I really mean uh, not only detection, but actually, you know, everything from detection to assessment, traceability, monitoring. So really to cover, um, you know, um, everything that is related to vulnerability management and analysis, uh, and also a solution to help you meet uh, your cybersecurity requirements, policy regulation, to have everything documented and ready for auditing according, you know, to the upcoming standards and, uh, and regulation. Uh, and the last part is actually to do it continuously, right? So you can uh, constantly, do, uh, constantly do that and have the true risk posture of your entire fleet or your entire component uh, very much automatically. Uh, yeah, so that was uh, a quick uh, presentation of this cyber digital twin concept and how we implement it in uh, say Bello. Uh, I would like to hear your thoughts about it. So my email is here at the bottom. Drop me a line. I would love to chat. Thank you. Thanks, Slava. That was very informative and inspiring. We hope this session helped you wrap your head around the concept of cyber digital twins and how it may change the way information is being shared throughout our supply chain. If you would like to learn more, you're more than welcome to visit the website cyberdigitaltwin.com. Thank you.